Welcome to Moving Conversations, a podcast for movement professionals by movement professionals. If you coach, train, or teach movement, Pilates, or fitness, then this podcast is for you. With more than 60 years of experience in fitness and Pilates, your hosts, Brian Ritchie and Nora St. John, explore the science of human movement, diving deep into the facts, myths, and common misconceptions, hoping to spark a thought and conversation about how we view fitness and movement. Now, let's jump into Moving Conversations. Welcome to another edition of Moving Conversations. I'm Brian Ritchie. Joining me is Nora St. John. How are you doing today, Nora? Very well, thank you. It's a lovely day here in California. We're finally getting some of our actual summer weather, and that's uh, just great. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're warming up this weekend too, which is nice. It'll be a little bit warmer, which I love. My kids hate because they don't want to be outside when it's hot and sticky. And I'm like, oh, that's the best part. You can wear shorts and t-shirts. And it's so much better than all this cold weather we've been having. So <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. Well, I think you're born and raised in Hawaii, which you know, I think wherever you're born and raised, kind of that's the environment you're used to. Because I was born and raised in LA. So, you know, warm, dry weather is just normal for me. Exactly. I, I joke about it all the time. It's like, I'm still not used to being in the cold. Been here 20 years. I'm still yeah, not used matter. to it. Yeah. Nope. Your body grew. Your body grew up in 80 degrees, right? Exactly. Exactly. When people say, "What? What was it like in the winter time?" I said, "Well, it might get down to you know low 70s. You know, <laughs> overnight it's a little bit chillier." I do remember because our homes there are jealousy windows and there's no insulation. Uh-huh. So right. when it does dip down, because occasionally it would get really cold into like the 50s. And you'd see people wearing, you know, two pair of pants and all their shirts and, you know, right. long, you know, a couple of windbreakers and thinking it's so cold because we can't heat the house. So, yeah. But right. and, and you're just not used to it. You, you really, your blood really does get kind of thin and, you, and your cold tolerance is just so low. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> well, today I want to bring up a topic that I've studied for a number of years and I think something that a lot of people in the fitness industry uh, in general, sort of forget about, and that's thoracic movement. Yep. You know, we have a tendency to think of the low back or the cervical spine if we're thinking about the spine at all. And people don't realize how important, you know, getting your thoracic going. I think with posture, people are becoming a little bit more aware of it because of kyphosis. But I don't think people really understand, you know, the structure of it, what it really does, what it's supposed to do, and how we should train it and get into a healthier state. And how important it is for functional movement of all kinds, both sports related and daily activity related. And that when it, it's limited, when you have limited thoracic mobility, that will mean that that mobility that should be happening in the spine is gonna happen in the shoulders, gonna happen in the neck, or it's gonna move that mobility somewhere else if you have to actually get you know, some, some range of motion going. And that can lead to increased stress on the shoulders or the cervical spine, or even down into the hips and the pelvis. Well, the lumbar spine especially, we've seen a lot more research in the past, what, five years, 10 years that's come out that has shown that increasing thoracic rotation allows the spine to become more stable and has reduced a lot of people's low back pain. Awesome, which again speaks to, if all of the joints are sharing the load, right? Things work better. And, and it, just you think about talking about the kinetic chain, right? Going from the feet all the way up through and, and how force gets transferred from joint to joint moves through the body. If there's a block anywhere, it's going to influence the joints above and below that. Yep. Right? Because that energy should move through smoothly. You've got all those vertebra, right? To kind of move that energy all the way up from the hips, through the pelvis, through the spine, up through the neck and the shoulders. Um, and if you miss that piece, then that, that force will end up somewhere else. Either the mobility will end up accentuated somewhere else, or just the force will end up kind of jamming up in different places. Yeah, yeah, we see that a lot. And I think most people, you and I talked about this yesterday, uh, when you're talking about the spine, most people forget that we're talking about a lot of joints put together, not just three. A lot of people think, well, we have the cervical, we have the lumbar, we have the thoracic, no. Each joint, each spinal unit is a joint. And when you think about that, it changes everything because we do want it to be smooth. We want smooth movement. We don't want it to be choppy. We want everything to be nice and smooth and flowing uh, through our spine if we're doing rotation or extension, flexion, lateral flexion, whatever it is. And I think people forget about that, that it is so segmented that we need everything to be working properly the way it was designed. 
it's almost like if you think of you know the old game of telephone. You're not just going telephone to three, you know, lumbar, thoracic, cervical. Yep. You're going telephone between every single vertebra, you know, all five lumbar, all 12 thoracic, all seven cervical up into the head. And all of those need to communicate. And ideally, it's a very smooth uh, handoff from one to the other, like yeah. a long relay race of, of energy moving up through the spine or down through the spine. The one thing that I think is different about the thoracic is the cage that it connects to. Because if you think about our cervical and our lumbar, Let's just talk range of motion. We'll get into some anatomy stuff in a minute. But if you just think of range of motion, how much in our lumbar and our cervical, we have flexion, extension, and lateral flexion. That's a lot of movement that we can do in those areas. Yet the thoracic, because it's attached to the rib cage, because we have that thorax that really limits some of our range of motion, not all of it, obviously, but it does change how it moves because it's attached to this cage. Right, and you've got, you, you have more vertebrae. So like you think about, you know, five in the lumbar, seven in the cervical, which gives you less individual segments. You've got more segments in the thoracic. Mm -hmm. So you can spread smaller amount of movement over a larger number of segments. But you also have these ribs that are not going to allow you to, you know, you can't squeeze your ribs together if you go into lateral flexion, for example. Right. Right, so they're just going to stiffen that that area to some extent and limit the range of motion in certain areas and, and and give you extra range of motion in other areas, but mostly just really limit things or change things. Yeah, let's talk about anatomy. If you look at all the vertebrae, for instance, each each segment, and in my opinion, each vertebrae themselves, when you look at even T1 compared to T12, they're very different looking uh, mm -hmm. as we go down the spine. Uh, higher up you are, we have a smaller body of the vertebrae. You know, uh, just because there's a lot less weight bearing on the area, it doesn't need to be large. That's one reason. As we get lower down, the body of the vertebrae becomes a little larger. In the thoracic, we also have that spinous process pointing at a downward angle rather than straight back. Right. You know, so you can definitely see some differences immediately between the thoracic versus our lumbar and our uh, cervical area. But the other thing we need to talk about is, are those areas where the ribs do attach? Right, because the ribs, the, the ribs are interesting because certainly the, you know, a chunk of the ribs attach to two vertebrae, right? So they really, they, they connect that junction of the vertebra between one and the other because the ribs will go to the bottom of one vertebra and the top of the other vertebra to go around to the front. So that's going to create a lot more stability also right and and stabilize each of those joints more than they would be if you don't have a rib attached like you don't in the cervical and the lumbar exactly exactly so yeah when you look at the anatomy aspect of it something something that keeps going through my head is we a lot of times we say form you know form equals function uh right you know i really think that function follows what the form is because yeah in the human body especially, whatever our form is, is going, to is going to give us whatever our range of motion should be, is going to give yeah. us our limitations. And when we yeah. talk about something like the, the spine, we're talking about the thoracic spine, for instance, the rib cage is definitely, and our ribs are definitely going to be a limiting factor because they are adding some of that inherent joint stability because of where they do attach on to of the vertebrae at one time you know, I, th I think a lot of people sort of don't realize that. Maybe you can go into a little bit more detail on that. Uh, even I, when I first got into this, you know, we knew, oh, yeah, the rib cage, it attaches to the spine. And you think, well, there's 12 ribs, there's 12 spine. Oh, one, one attaches to, you know, T1 is the first rib, T2 is the second rib. And it's not until you really look at it and realize, well, the ribs actually have this almost downward angle as it wraps, you know, comes out of the spine a little bit downward and wraps around and where it attaches. It's a lot more, I hate to use the word confusing, but there's a lot more going on than I think meets the eye. If you want to get into a little yeah. bit of detail on that and go into uh, a little bit more on the anatomy of it. Well, um, a couple of things. So if you think about the rib cage, um, the first, the first few ribs, a lot of them really don't have so much of a dual, dual attachment. Then you get into kind of the major ribs, and they have this attachment where the rib will come around and attach both to the vertebra below it and the vertebra above it. So like the fifth rib will attach both to the fourth and the fifth uh, thoracic vertebra. 
for example. And as it comes around, the thing about that is when it comes around, then it attaches to cartilage, right? You have the costochondral junction where it's going to attach to the cartilage, which then is going to attach into the sternum. So you also have this flexible piece, this flexible, funny junction between the rib and the cartilage that allows for the mobility of the ribs. Um, and so, you know, if you think about breathing in, and you think about that those ribs being attached to the back of the vertebra, you know, as you inhale, they're going to rotate slightly down in the back to lift them up to the sides, kind of like a wing lifting up on the inhale. On the exhale, the wings drop down and those vertebra kind of rotate back into place. So that, sorry, the, the rib head rotates back into place. So there's also this mobility that's happening at the rib head attached to the vertebra. Um, that is what allows us to breathe. So there's a lot of dynamic action happening with the ribs attached to the vertebra. Um, and the breath is a really a key component to mm -hmm. all of that mobility. Yeah, that was the thing that would sort of, I always try and think back to is when we, it has a lot more movement than people think. And it wasn't until- It has a lot more, yes. Yeah, it's yeah. not until we think about the breath that we realize how much really almost three-dimensional movement the, the ribs have. You know, they move out to the side, they lift up, they move forward. They're, the movement of the ribs is a lot more dynamic than people think, and we need that it to be that way. We need them to be able to spread out. We need the intercostals to be able to contract when we want forcible, uh, you know, forced exhale. But we also need them to be incredibly flexible to inhale and to open up and allow that expansion of the rib cage. Right, and, and so thinking about that, one of the things that uh, just with time will limit rib cage mobility is, um, well, two things. One, rib cage mobility will often uh, change in time, so people will get less mobile in their ribs over time. And a lot of that comes from lack of really using the full potential of the, of the ribs in breathing and in movement. So, you know, they, they talk a lot too about how what that limits is it actually limits the amount that the diaphragm can move down and up. So if the ribs aren't moving in and out with every breath, if they don't have the mobility of the ribs, which really is relates to the mobility of the thorax altogether in the thoracic spine specifically, if you don't have that mobility, then you actually limit how much that diaphragm can move up and down when you breathe and it limits your, uh, your ability to bring air in, right? Your, your vocal, uh, your, your volume of air that's possible. It also, in that situation, I've seen a number of people who we say breathe with their neck and you can really see their scalenes yeah. are actually doing a lot of work in order to let that diaphragm move. When the ribs aren't moving, it's literally the scalenes that are lifting up on the rib cage, lifting it upward to create some of that space so you can take a breath in, but you can, you watch them, they're breathing with those neck muscles. You know, when they breathe, their right. rib cage goes up and back down rather than in and out the expansion uh, and contraction. Which also relates to, um, Again, how do, how do we work with the thorax? And the thorax is such an interesting area. I mean, just the whole thoracic spine, I'm really including the, the rib cage in the whole area because breath is a key part of working with it. And, and I found in creating mobility and creating um, just dynamic action of it. If, if the breath isn't working, then you can certainly work from the movement side into the breath. But I think if you have breath and movement combined, it really helps to get the mobility going in that area. Because every time you breathe in, your ribs, your rib cage expands, ideally, right? The muscles get active. You have some activity both in the intercostals, also in the rectus spinae in the back, right? All that opens up and then it comes back in. So you're getting that dynamic action with every breath. Mm -hmm. um, and that's an important piece of, um, of working with, with the thoracic spine. And that's usually something that I start people with almost one of their first sessions that I work with them. I wanna see how their spine is moving. I want to see when they lie down, where their arch is in their back, you know, is it mid, you know, mid back, is it low back, all of that kind of thing. And I find people with the mid back, their ribs are often fixated. They're very, I'm not going to say they're stuck, but they're a little more rigid than they need to be. There's not as much malleability. And, yep. you know, I just have them, you know, hold the sides of their ribs and say, okay, take a deep breath in and nothing moves. You know, you can see their stomach move or maybe they have a little rise of the anterior posterior, but you're not seeing that lateral movement. Right. And that's one thing that, you know, just having them lie down and focus on that movement, focus on pushing into the fingertips a little bit and allowing that lateral movement 
really can benefit people and get other things to relax and get a little bit more mobility going within the thorax in its in and of itself. The other thing about that that breathing is it you know, breathing that way can also activate you know much more of our parasympathetic nervous system and calm mm. people down. Just which which can also just decrease tension generally, which can be effective if you're trying to increase mobility, right? Um, one thing that I like to talk about there too is is we work a lot on getting that mobility through the lower ribs, right? Or like putting the hands around the bottom of your ribs. If you're out there, you can play with this with us, right? And then then breathing out, breathing in, and having that width, right? Having the ribs be able to open three dimensionally in that low part. Something that I like to work on too is um, breathing actually up into the upper ribs. Now the first, second, and third ribs especially are particularly stiff and don't tend to be as mobile. Um, just in terms of they're smaller, they're stiffer, there's just less mobility there, and they don't have as, uh, as much of a, of a cartilaginous junction. So they're just stiffer. But one of the things that I find a lot is clients with uh, neck and shoulder issues often have very, very limited mobility in their upper thorax. Yep. So for example, you know, and again, you guys can join us here at home. If you put your hand on your upper back, feel like those top vertebra below your neck, and you breathe in, do those move at all? And for a whole lot of clients, they don't move at all. Yep. So there's literally you know, no mobility in that upper thorax, which again means, as we talked about earlier, that that force transfer may go through the lumbar, may move through the lower thoracic vertebra, then get stuck. And that means that that mobility is going to have to happen maybe up in the cervical spine or in the shoulders, depending on what the movement is. Yeah, we see that so with I, the... I work a lot on just that, that upper breath. Yeah, we see that a lot with like a dowager's hump. Uh, some of our yeah. older oh, yeah. clients that are really rounded with a forward head carriage and we've got the kyphosis and everything. But even if you correct some of that and get them stronger so they can get that the lower thoracic moving, they still are stuck in that upper thoracic. Mm -hmm. You know, and that area can become really almost, again, fixated. It almost becomes yeah, frozen. really fixated. Yep. You know, that it becomes just, you know almost ossified that it's just, it's stuck. It's not going to move. You're not going to see much movement occur there. No. And even, honestly, even with my, I mean, all of my clients, all of the instructors that I work with can be every age from, you know, 20 to 90. Mm -hmm. um, I find that that area can be really, really stuck in anybody of any age. True. You know, if, I, if I'm in just a group of, you know, 20 Pilates teachers or whatever, and I'm teaching something and I, and I mention that and ask how many people feel that move, at least half the room can't move it. Mm-hmm. You know, and, that, and that's every age, every whatever. So I feel like that, that stiffness is extremely common. Mm -hmm. And again, I find that if that gets moved, mobility, a lot of neck and shoulder issues clear up. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll, you know, just work on just putting your hand there and seeing if you can breathe into those upper vertebra. Um, and a lot of times that over time, they'll start to learn to do that. That'll open up the whole upper body. That'll help to open up the neck muscles. You know, the scalenes get some relief from that. The SCM gets some relief from that. A lot of the shoulder muscles get some relief. Exactly. From that. Um, you know, and it just, it just brings more life and energy into the area. Yeah. One of the things I like to do is put someone either on something like a foam roller, a softer foam roller yeah. or yep. the spine fit or something that's going to have a little bit of compression into that area, into the musculature. And mm -hmm. just do like scissor arms, one arm overhead as one arm comes down to the yep. side. Do arm circles, yep. uh, both arms overhead without arching the back and without lifting the ribs. Just allowing that because we are getting mobility of the shoulder, serratus anterior, lats, all of that that might be tight anyway. So we get all of that. But it's also putting a little bit of pressure in that area, a little bit of gentle pressure because you're on the foam roller. And that can mm -hmm. really help to get a little bit of mobilization without getting so aggressive, which is why I like the softer foam roller. It also conforms to the spine a little bit more. The harder foam roller, I find you get these hot spots, you know, where yeah, your body is. Exactly. Whereas yeah. something that's a little bit more, a little softer, more malleable can sort of conform a little bit to your spine. And then when you're doing those exercises, you know, just with the arms, you get a little bit of that gentle pressure in that area and it can really help to mobilize. And some, and some, not just the pressure, but you're also moving the muscles around it, right? When you move the arms and the, the rhomboids are moving, the lats are moving, the, the trapezius is moving a bit, right? Yep. And all those attach onto the spine. Yep. So, and especially if you're doing asymmetrical movements, one up, one down, or, you know, one out, one in, then you're going to get some of that 
uh, rotational component through those muscles into the vertebra, which is always mobilizing, mm -hmm. right? A lot of times if you can get, in this case, the vertebra being pulled in two different directions by you know one arm going up, one arm going down, these muscles working this way, these muscles pulling that way, that alone can help to just mobilize those joints gently. Uh, super simple, super easy. I do those all the time mm -hmm. and just love them. Um, one other thing that, that I do, which is, um, well, it's just a different way to do it, is have clients lie prone on a foam roller or even better, really like a yoga bolster. So something a little mm -hmm. softer than a foam roller. Or if I'm using a foam roller, I'll often pad them, like pad their chest and stuff because it's just hard. And then I might have them support their head with their hands. Sure. Um, so, you know, you're prone the roller, but the roller is below the sternal notch because otherwise you feel like, you, you know, <laughs> you talk funny um, and breathe because what that does is that actually blocks the breath going forward, which in the upper, the upper body, we often, you know, we can bring the chest forward pretty easily, especially with kind of a panicky breath, right? Yep. The chest will rise and instead it's blocked from there. So then when you breathe into that upper vertebra or anywhere, really, the, the, the air has to go into the back. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's just another, you know, yours is doing it through proprioception, mine's doing it more through kind of blocking the breath going forward, so it's forced to go into the back of the body. Um, and I'll typically do that with, um, you know, a little tactile cue. So I'll just have my hand on their back and say, breathe into my hand here, breathe into my hand here, breathe into my hand here. Um, interesting. And that's another way that I'll, I'll work with just uh, some thoracic mobility. Yeah, that's interesting because I've had people do the same thing, but almost for a different reason is I like the pressure that occurs on the actual sternum mm. because mm -hmm. as I, as there's a little bit of pressure, you know, you, you keep it low enough that you're not going to feel like you're choking, but that pressure, I find a lot of people with the costal cartilage where it attaches to the sternum can become very stuck. That can become very rigid, uh, especially people who train a lot of chest and things like that. That area can become uh -huh. very tight and just lying on it and adding the breath to that can allow the pressure to open that area up a little bit. And even taking one arm slightly forward or back, you know, just a little bit of shuffling of the arms yeah. or using yeah. the arms to pull myself slightly forward. So there's a little bit of tugging on the tissue in various side to side forward and back actually gives you a little bit of that self massage in a way that I don't nice. think is ever spoken about. You know, in when you see a lot of literature on release work, you rarely see people say, okay, lie on your stomach you know, lie in a prone yeah. position on a foam roller, you know, that's not, yeah. that's not intuitive, you know, lying on your back is a lot more intuitive, but I find just that little bit of movement can give a nice release to those attachment points. Well, and like we're, we're looking at a circular system, right? Mm -hmm. Like the vertebra, the ribs go around to the sternum and attach, you have a ring going on. So approaching it from the back, approaching it from the front, like approaching from the side, wherever you're going to go, but but that's that's fantastic because then you've got that, you know, whatever mobility you're working on in the front is going to influence the back. Mm -hmm. Whatever you work on the back is going to influence the front because it is a ring. It is yeah. a continuous ring. So that's great. I love that. Yeah. And I mean, how tight do people's chests get? Oh, unbelievable. I mean, really tight. Whether they again, whether they're lifting or whether they're just living life. That can be so tight, that whole front, you know, sternum, if you think about the pectoralis major going, you know, along the clavicle, along the sternum, then along the top of the, um, the ribs there, it's like, oh, my Lord. When that gets tight, it pulls everything in, right? It yep. gets that nice rounded feeling and that kind of uh, decompression or compression of the sternum. And we also think about the pec minor with rounded shoulders, that it can yeah. really tighten up as well. And that can help to just, like I say, just loosen that area up a little bit for self-massage. Another thing that I've done mm -hmm. for self-massage, and I mean, we've all done this, I think, is just taking a small ball and start at the sternum and move our way toward the shoulder, you know, rolling the ball up, maybe go through some, you know, arm movements at the same time just to allow a little bit of massage. But again, a little bit more passively is lying on the foam roller where you are just taking the breath. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And that can help with people who do have kyphosis because the next thing I want to sort of go into is, you know, we're talking about range of motion, you know, mm -hmm. we're talking about flexion, extension, lateral flexion, rotation. Well, the thoracic, you've been in a number of my classes, I focus a lot on thoracic rotation, but something that I think a lot of people forget about is we also want to explore the other ranges of motion because if those get a little sticky and don't have good mobility, we're really going to be limited in our movement patterns. 
Right. Right. Absolutely. You know, so let's break those down. Uh, the one that I think is probably the one that people forget about the most is going to be extension. I think it's yeah probably in Pilates, it's, you know, heralded a lot more than it ever is in fitness. Uh -huh. You know, when we think of extension and fitness, a lot of people go immediately to, they think back extensions and all of that sort of thing. And it's mostly lumbar. They rarely think about doing it through their thoracic. So I'm going to back you up a little bit because one of the things that I, I think about a lot, and there's some research to back this up that I read a long time ago. So I'm still like, I haven't found it again. So we'll, we'll just throw it out there. Um, I feel like if I'm trying to get mobility, especially in the thoracic spine, that I actually really start with rotation. Sure. That I find, I find and generally in the spine generally, that I find rotation gets me the most mobility gains mm -hmm. that then I can take into flexion, extension, lateral flexion. Um, but ro rotation is really where, like, can you just picture that for a moment? Just, again, I'm taking us back to rotation here, but um, you, you picture the facet joints rotating on each other. Mm -hmm. You know, like the little, and, and you think about the discs rotating on each other. You think about all those tiny little spinal muscles, both the deep ones, the multifidi, the rotatories, the interspinalis, et cetera, all the erector spinae are getting lubricated and stimulated by a rotational action. Mm -hmm. and, and like we talked about with just, you know, the, the ribs they're, and breathing, they're also getting stimulated um, in opposition to each other. So creating, you know, one's pulling up, one's pulling down, basically. One's pulling right, one's pulling left. So that you're getting that that real mobility through um, when you do thoracic rotation. Absolutely, I I find thoracic rotation is probably the easiest entry point for thoracic mm -hmm. movement. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, when you're looking at thoracic uh, rotation, when you're assessing somebody, let's say someone comes to you and you want to take a look at that. What do you find is the best assessment for that? What do you find is, you know, a key to watch how they move to see if that is something that might be lacking? So I've, I've looked at a bunch of different things for this and I have a bunch of different ways of thinking about it. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I can't say that I have the best way yet. So I'm going to throw it a couple okay. and <laughs> see, see which one makes sense. So, so one thing that I'll often do is um, uh, an exercise that, you know, we use in Pilates a lot, but it's not a Pilates exercise specifically called either pinwheel or telescope. Um, and basically this is you know, a sideline exercise where the knees are bent. So you're kind of in an L, L sit or a, a Z sit position, not really a Z sit position. You're just, a, your knees are bent, lying on the floor sideways. And you take the arm forward, uh, both arms are on top of each other. You take that arm forward, you circle it up and around to the back and over the hips. Mm -hmm. So you're taking, um, or you can simply just take that arm and ro rotate it open and then rotate it closed. So the hips are stable in, in, this, in this one scenario. I'm trying to keep the knees together, the bottom leg on the floor, and I'm just rotating that torso to see how far they can go. Mm -hmm. And basically how far that back hand goes off the floor behind them. Right, or maybe it goes all the way to the floor behind them, but whatever, how far that is. Then the other side, I'll look at that also and see if there's a lot of range of motion there or not. That's one, um, if, if they can lie down, if that's comfortable. Another one that I do as, at a much simpler level, and often I have found this is a limitation, is just a seated rotation. Sure. You know, somebody just sitting on a chair, um, you know, hands on their thighs and just rotating one direction, rotating the other direction. And I've had clients who it's so clear, even just from that simple exercise, that they go to the right, but they don't go to the left or they don't go either direction very well. Right. So, you know, depending on what I'm trying to do, I'll kind of take something simple or something more, more complicated. I love the telescope arms. That's something that I teach probably 90% of my clients. Uh, the thing that I usually always will tell them, though, is it's where the shoulder ends up, not where the hand, because that way the glenohumeral joint, they're not trying to reach with that hand so much as it is trying to lay the shoulders on the ground. Uh, right. I just, you know, I want their mindset to be a little bit more proximal rather than thinking yeah. distal in that sense. Yeah. Uh, whereas if you're doing pinwheel, because you are circling the arm, you really have to sort of reach out from with the hand. You have to make that a little larger range of motion. Uh one of my favorite things, and this is just watching people move, I watch people walk from behind. 
Yeah. Are they turning their shoulders? Right. How many times do we watch someone walk and they're walking very robotically? Their arms are swinging, but they're swinging from the elbows and not, or just the shoulder joint, but they're not really getting that natural motion through the thoracic spine. They're not rotating. I always say they're doing river dance instead of walking. <laughs> yes, exactly. Right, because you know, in case you've seen somebody, and it's like sometimes they're not even moving their arms. Yep. Right, they really are just not rotating their torso at all, um, and they're and they're maybe they're shuffling, maybe they're not, but they really are not letting that motion move through the hips up into the spine and and do its natural rhythm. Yeah, yeah. I've always wondered if anybody's done any research. This is something that one of these days I'm going to have an opportunity to look at, but looking at runners. And those mm -hmm. who swing their arms bigger or smaller, because I've watched some runners and they, when they swing their arms, they're very self-contained. They keep it tight to the body. Yeah. And others that seem to have a lot longer, more graceful look to them when they're swinging their arms. Yeah. And I don't know if either one has really been looked at to provide more power, if sprinters versus long distance, all of that sort of thing. Uh, I remember as a kid, guy across the street, Brad, when he would run, he didn't swing his arms forward and back. He actually swung them sort of side to side. Oh. And I'd never seen that before. And as, you know, I'm, even as a kid, I was watching the body. I was like, wow, but he was also the fastest kid in the neighborhood. Oh, interesting. So it was interesting because I'd watch that. I'm thinking, is that giving him more speed? I doubt it. I think he was right. just fast. But in yeah. watching that motion, he had a lot of rotation Whereas forward and back, he, you know, we don't have nearly as much as that's, you know, swinging side to side. So it's always something that I've wondered when it comes to athletics and things of that nature, you know, for runners, is it, you know, keeping it in tight or swinging the arms? If one may give you a little grit, more momentum or a little bit more freedom in the rotation, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. It's just something that I, you know, every now and then wonder about. Well, this brings us immediately, Brian. So we've gone from like breathing to running. So we just, we just, we just made a jump. We just made a jump. A little bit uh, of a jump. Really like, yeah, I like it. Uh, but you know, one of the things that, uh, the reason that we focus a lot on thoracic mobility is exactly for that. And, and whether you're running or walking, that force transfer from the legs, through the hips, through the spine, out the shoulders, out the neck, is, is fundamental to an efficient movement pattern for any human, period. Right, and if, if that rotation isn't happening, if it's stuck somewhere in the spine, again, it'll either end up not transferring or end up you know, stuck in the lumbar, stuck in the hip, stuck in the spine somewhere else um, that doesn't need to be. So this brings us to that other thing we we're thinking about as we talked about this, which is that interaction between the thorax and the arms and the pelvis and how all of that energy flows through. Now, I want to say one more thing about, about the runners. Um, one of my favorite things is to watch the Olympics and to watch, you know, amazing runners run. Mm -hmm. And um, it's interesting to me what you said, because like I think about Usain Bolt, because he has been the fastest man for a while. And you look at his gait and his posture when he's running versus, you know, Mr. Green, who is like second fastest in the world, at least for a while there. Uh, and, 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 High level, like these are the best runners in the world, right? This top 10 or whatever who are, are competing in the, the final the heats. And, and there's so many different ways to run that are all elite, right? They're all elite. These guys mm -hmm. are all the top in the world. And some of them, again, are tighter, right? They have that tight little, uh, their arms are really close to their side. It's not a big range. Other ones really reach. And you see the difference in rotation. Um, you know, in, the, in the different people who are running, even again at that high level. You do see a lot of rotation, though. You know, I always see a lot of rotation. I see a lot of that arm reach. It's just a matter of how, how much they control that. And you think about force transfer and the kinetic chain through that area. You know, some may just be tighter mm -hmm. and they rely a little bit more on um, elastic recoil and kind of that wind up and that release and that wind up and that release. And others may be relying on different ways of getting their speed up. Yeah. And I also wonder if you're providing so much power coming from the lower body. It's got to go somewhere besides just the ground. Your, your force is going through the ground, but if you stymie it any way up the chain, all that force has to go somewhere. So there's, it's going to hit a wall someplace. And it seems like the more mm -hmm. rotation that you do, you're releasing that energy and allowing that motion to continue on and really sort of allowing that 
power to come from the ground all the way up, almost like through the fingertips. We've also got the wind up and the release. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of research in, in the fascia world about that wind up and release piece. And if you're running really fast, then when you, you know, when you pull to one side, you're tensioning those tissues and then you release that tension and you release that tension, you release that tension. And there's, there's a lot to be said for how that, that actually makes more speed and more power. You're kind of winding up the whole thoracolumbar fascia and other things and moving that forward. So there's also that piece. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, these are just, you know, for the listener at home, this is what Nora and I do for fun <laughs> is we go down these rabbit holes with one another and just, hmm, I wonder. And it, it's sort of like I was talking to my son last night. I said, it's sort of like an opportunity to scratch my brain. You know, to put a little yeah, bit of a, exactly. a little a little something in there that is going to bother me now for a few days until I start looking stuff up. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting you mentioned even the fascia because uh, we are transferring so much force into that thoracolumbar yeah. area. And then, again, yeah. it's thoracolumbar. It's not just lumbar. So we're talking about going into the thorax and that rotation. So when we think about even – you use this in uh, some of the fascia classes we've taught – is throwing a ball – you know, if you just throw it with your hand, your elbow, your shoulder, or you do the full wind up, or you do a step in a wind up, you're using your whole body, you're pushing off and you're really generating power from the ground up. But a lot of it does have to do with controlling the power and bringing the power from the foot and the leg all the way up and letting it go through the upper body, through the thorax, allowing that rotation, which is so important in your release. You know, if you think of it like an old-fashioned trebuchet uh, or, you know, slingshot slingshot yeah. sort of thing, you're yeah. really taking something and you're winding it up. And now that area has to be able to allow it to let go. You know, where the mm -hmm. arm, so many people think that when you throw a ball, for instance, a pitcher, I used to be a pitcher, you're controlling it with the hand. No, the hand is just your end point. Right. You're controlling it with everything from your thorax to your shoulder, and your hand is just a long extension that allows it to go faster. You're just taking that lever and making it a longer lever as you're releasing it. It's the whip. It's right? a whip. Exactly. Yep. It's the whip. It's the whip. That, you know, in some ways, your foot is the handle, mm -hmm. if you will. Right? Yeah. At least if you're planting a foot and then throwing, right? The foot is the handle. And then that long, snaky whip goes up and the, the final boom, it del is delivered by the hand. Yes. Right? The energy has to move through that whole chain and then boom, it's delivered by the hand. Yes, exactly. That's a great way to think about it. I hadn't thought of it as a whip, but that's really what's happening. You're right. It's mm -hmm. that final little, you know, movement. And without thoracic rotation, you're not going to get that. You know, it's going to get yeah, stuck no. between the lumbar and the shoulder if you don't have yeah. that bridge to allow that movement. And you're going to take that force in your lumbar spine or in the shoulder joint. Yeah, exactly. I was actually reading, um, I was on this topic lately because I'm thinking about the upper body and how it works as, uh, how it all works together. And um, it was interesting. They were talking about things like uh, baseball pitchers and tennis players and how the you know, how, how the force hits the ball, if it's a tennis player, for example, in a serve, and what the rest of the body is doing, kind of how that energy moves through the body, how the kinetic chain activates. And it was really fascinating because one thing they said was, for tennis serves specifically, and this is, this is different in different sports, but for tennis serves specifically, that, you know, there's the toss up of the ball with, you know, the one hand, and then there's the, the reach back with the other hand, and the idea here was that you they actually start the serve from the upper body, but the idea, so you, you start mm -hmm. with the, the hand reaching towards, you know, the racket reaching towards the ball, mm -hmm. but the idea is that the lower body power comes in at the moment of impact. Oh, meeting in the middle. Yeah, which I thought was really interesting. Because I always thought of it as being, you know, distal to proximal, like I would push with my leg first and that would move it out through the arm. But anyway, this one, you know, this, again, this is just doing the tennis serve and everything's a little different, but they're really talking about how like what they're, yeah, there's certainly some lower body happening, but like the lower body power you want, like that, that hip whip, if you will, or that hip motion or that movement of the, the energy from the lower body, you want to hit its max as you're hitting that ball. 
to create maximum power. And that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. It does. I just hadn't kind of thought about how all that went together. It was just like, oh, that's interesting. And I think, I think also the difference is when someone like you or I, who hasn't, you know, necessarily held a tennis racket in a little while and, you know, isn't a regular player versus yeah. someone yeah. that we're watching, you know, on television, who's a high level, you know, athlete, it's a lot different because they're hitting the ball at over a hundred miles an hour. And, you know, ours, yeah. I don't know about you, but I'm not approaching that speed. <laughs> No, and I and I know my timing's off, right? Like I I, I picture myself because I used to play tennis when I was, you know, in a long time ago, and I think, oh, that's why I wasn't a good tennis player because I can picture like, oh, that would come, and then this would happen, and then I would think about my arm, and I really didn't think about my lower body, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm not even I'm not really using that kinetic chain efficiently. Um, and again, if you don't have, I want to say two things. One, if you don't have the mobility in the thorax, you can't transfer the force well. And I'm gonna go the other side too, that if you're hypermobile in the thorax and the shoulders, you also don't transfer force well. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, just to, just to throw that piece out because that's not the general issue, but every now and then, you know, I've worked with a lot of hypermobile dancers and gymnasts and things. Um, and you see how like they can't throw to save their life because the force doesn't transfer joint to joint. The joints are so loose mm -hmm. that the energy actually gets dissipated by the, joint, by the transfer from joint to joint. The kinetic chain is leaky, right, is one, one term sometimes for that. Interesting. Interesting. I work with a lot of golfers, and I was just thinking even of the golf swing, how much thoracic rotation is necessary. And those who don't rotate well, it is sticky. And your body will begin to compensate in so many other ways, whether it be the yeah. lumbar spine, through the knees, through yeah. the hips, uh, or through the wrists, you know, the arms, and you can see the person who leads with their arms and it's almost like they're trying to overpower it with their arms, but their lower body doesn't get involved because they can't bridge between the lower body to the upper body. Right, right. One other, one other study I was reading was, was analyzing that and basically said, and I think this again was for tennis, um, but basically said, um, no, actually it was for pitchers, it was for baseball pitchers. And, and, the idea here was they could measure how much of the kinetic energy was being developed in different parts of the body. Mm -hmm. And generally you're looking for about 50% to come from the lower body and the rest kind of comes through the arms and the shoulders, et cetera. But they said, if the lower body wasn't contributing, so let's say the upper body, you know, say the shoulder girl contributes 25%. Um, if the lower body wasn't doing its part, the upper body's uh, percentage went up to like 35 or 40%. Mm. And they were more likely to get shoulder injuries, mm -hmm. right? So again, whether you're working with an ordinary client who just wants to have better mobility or a high level athlete, a lot of that is that force transfer. It's not just that they're weak in the lower body, that it isn't transferring efficiently up and through. So you're just looking at, looking at um, working on thoracic rotation for, for all those reasons. What's interesting is I'm now going through my head and those tennis players that I've worked with who have all developed shoulder problems are all the ones who do lack thoracic rotation. And yeah. it's always, they, they, we've figured out it's from the serve. And part uh -huh. of it is, you know, they're usually a little bit older and that overhead movement, we don't do it regularly. And doing it in a ballistic fashion probably isn't the wisest idea uh, in general. But yeah, if they're not able to generate that power it's all gonna come from just the shoulder. They're trying to overpower it using just their arms. Yep. And again, in a ballistic fashion with the arm overhead, so you've already got that shoulder in a compromised position and you're not allowing the rest of the body to either con contribute and generate power or dissipate power. Right, right, either way. Either way, it's gonna get stuck and it's gonna go through that shoulder joint. Yep. Interesting. That makes a lot of sense. Hmm. Right, which brings us back to training thoracic mobility. Yeah, <laughs> right? exactly. Because because you know, there, there really is clear evidence, I think, from, from these various studies I was reading and then you know your, your examples of um, that being a really key thing for not just performance improvement, but for injury prevention. Yes. And especially if you think about a lot of our clients. I mean, I don't work with professional athletes. I work with weekend warriors. I work with, you know, high level competitive at their club um, tennis players yep. who could be 50 to 80. 
Um, and, and, you know, we're not working with people who, who have that youthful body that recovers well. So, um, and work with people where generally that age range, the, the rib cage gets stiff for anyway through, you know, all the varieties of just, just change. So um, working on thoracic mobility and maintaining that, I think is really a key way both for maintaining um, oxygenation, basically the ability to breathe well, uh, and the ability to function well, mm -hmm. you know, whether again, it's daily activities or sports activities. Yeah. One of the first things I teach almost any golfer, tennis player is the thoracic movement, is getting them to be able to turn through their thoracic. Uh, so telescope arms is something that I'll have them do before they go out. And I teach a standing version of that up against the wall because you get a little mm -hmm. bit more, the arm that would be stuck on the ground, you can actually reach forward with that a little bit. Uh, and that way, right. you know, for my golfers, they're not lying on the ground, you know, just before they go out and play because you know, the ground might be wet, whatever. I want to make sure I give them something that they're able to accomplish and that they can do yeah. to warm up both sides and allow that motion to happen to remind their body, oh, yeah, I can move from here. Uh, yeah. I remember during the pandemic, one of my clients who was actually one of the few people that came to my studio uh, three times a week, we focused so much on that. Because he said, look, we're stuck in here anyway. We may as well get me better at golf. And we got him a whole lot better. And we focused probably 20 minutes a session on moving his thorax, just getting thoracic rotation nice. going, you know, with either nice. medicine ball, throwing it against the wall, you know, sand bell, you know, tossing that, you know, create, trying to create that movement in a fashion that's going to be a little bit more you know, a little bit more forceful because when you're swinging a club, you need it to be forceful. You need it to have that whipping action. Right. So it's not right. just doing telescope arms, which is under control, but also trying to get them to be able to release that energy, release it through their hands, you know, store it through their hip, come up through the legs, turn through the hips, turn through the thoracic area, and then release it through the hands. And it just, which is, creates that whip, which is, Right, which is the wind up. Yep. Right, creating, tra and, and when you're using, you know, medicine balls or smart belts, sand bells or whatever, using something like that, that's when you're getting that wind up mm -hmm. and that release. So you're also really working the fascial tissues very differently there than you would be in something much gentler like a, you know, a pinwheel or a telescope arms. Yeah. Right, because cause you want that. You want that like, like wind up release. And, and the timing is also very important if, if you're looking at a sport. That's one of the most important things. One of the things that I like to do is take you know, moderate sized medicine ball doesn't have to be heavy, you know, for a pounder, four to six, eight pounder, have them stand almost right next to the wall, maybe just, mm -hmm. you know, eight, 10 inches away, load the hip, turn through the thorax and then toss it into the wall and immediately catch it. And when the uh -huh. ball comes back to catch it, it almost resets their body. So they're creating a spring like effect of, you know, load, boom, come back and right back into a loaded position then explode, come right back into that loaded position, explode and getting into a rhythm, you know, where they're doing it over and over and over again, but it also retrains, load that hip, explode, load that hip, explode. You're also getting deceleration and acceleration. Oh yeah. And that really is nice. Right. Cause you're getting, you're getting the concentric, you know, the, the acceleration going back, but you're also getting the control, the deceleration coming you know, in, when it returns, right. Yep. Going out and coming back. Um, and that's, that's, that's again, creating that, I always think of that as creating that dynamic action within the, the myofascial system mm -hmm. that it can, it can, it can deliver power and it can also absorb power and deliver power and absorb power and creates a lot more of that, um, just, you know, ability to move, to mm -hmm. be, to be pliable. Yeah. And when we were talking about fascia earlier, we talk about how that rhythmic motion is so mm -hmm. important to train the fascial system in getting yep. those fibers to line up properly. So just grooving yeah. that, and like I say, I'll have them do, you know, for two minutes on one side, then two minutes the other side, even though that's not their dominant side. Uh, and that really can help, you know, sort of get that motion going. Nice. Yeah, yeah it's, just, it. it's just something that, you know, you can do in a small amount of space. You know, you don't need to... Right. Right. If you have a long hallway, it's great to bring the sand bell out or something a little bit bigger and you can whip it. But in a smaller space, if you have a wall, you can toss it and you don't have to throw it hard. A lot of times I yeah. have them throw, I use a Dynamax ball, which is more soft. It's a softer ball. Uh -huh. And they're just yeah. tapping the wall basically, but it's controlling it back. 
explode, yeah. control it back. And it does work. Yeah, cool. Yeah. So that's creating a lot of, of really good dynamic, um, just dynamic action mm -hmm. and rotation and, and in the whole kinetic chain, getting it all to connect. Yeah. So coming, just, just change, changing the focus a little bit. So one of the things that I find when I'm working on thoracic rotation, particularly but thoracic mobility anyway, is people are often stuck in very particular spots. Mm. Um, and it can be from how they drive, how they sit, how they work, how they work at their desk, you know, whatever. There's lots of ways why are there sports, whatever. There can be very distinctive spots in the thoracic spine that are moving or not moving quite as well as other spots. And that can be, it can be structural. It can be, you know, functional. Um, so one of the more subtle things that I do with some of my clients when it's appropriate is I really work on trying to help them identify where their thorax is moving and where it's a little bit stiffer. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes when I do that, I can really get them to identify the tight spot and then we can work specifically on that area to get some mobility there. Because when you think about the, all the many, many, many spinal muscles that are going up and down the spine, like you can get a little bit of a, a, a tear in there or a little bit of an irritation on something that can scar up a little chunk of muscle tissue on you know the left side of the spine between you know T6 and T8 or something and that can lead to stiffness in one sort of small segment mm -hmm. so um, I do two different things with that one thing I do is uh, a bridging exercise a very simple bridging exercise but I'll typically do it with the feet up on the wall or something higher than the floor because you can get up higher lift the hips up into the bridge and then take uh, rotation from there. So essentially we call it hip dips. You mm -hmm. drop a hip and you drop a hip, you drop a drop a hip. The higher up the hips are, the farther up the spine, the rotation will be occurring. Mm -hmm. Now this, this requires a bit of mind, body awareness and patience, which not every client has, I know. Um, but I've, I've worked with a few clients, um, particularly one who was an ex bodybuilder who then became a dancer who was really stiff in his thorax. Um, and we would just do this at the beginning of every session. He'd feet up on the wall, he'd come up as high as he could, and he would just take like hip dip rotating, and, he, and then he'd drop his hips one inch, go back and forth five or six times, hip, drop his hips an inch, go back and forth, and he would work through the mobility of the thoracic spine. And and then when he got up, like he could breathe better, he had more back extension, which is what was always our test for him, because he really couldn't extend much at all. Um, and he was more able to just move his spine in all directions. So again, that's a, a little bit of a refined thing to do, but he started to identify, oh, this is the spot that really doesn't move for me. And so then he'd know like, okay, I've got to work on that spot. Mm -hmm. And with awareness and focus, he could kind of get into it. So that's one thing that um, I've done to try to refine where exactly the spine isn't moving because sometimes sometimes the whole thorax is stiff sometimes there are specific spots that are stiff no that's a, that's a great way to isolate that because i find that mm -hmm. most most of us don't do that so i'm gonna have to use that with a couple of my clients because i'm even thinking about when they go into telescope arms we get to a certain point and they can't move any further mm -hmm. and we may get be stuck there for months because that's where their sticking point is and for whatever reason, and like you said, it could be environmental, it could be structural, we don't know. But finding out where that is would also help them out. Uh, and maybe they need to go in and see someone and get some body work done just to loosen that area up a little bit so they can move a little better. There's a lot of different options that we have down the road to try and get those areas moving better. Uh, but that's a great way to sort of figure that out because if you do find that it's higher up that you're you know, a little bit further up you're stuck, you're going to have a lot less rotation. That's going to be an area that's going to become stickier for a lot of people. And it's an area that we don't often train in rotation is the upper thorax, thoracic area. Right. And this, and, and I, again, this is just as I'm thinking of three different clients that I really worked with this on. Um, all of them were pretty kyphotic. All of them were pr really stiff in their thorax. And this, this was the trick that actually worked. I did pinwheel and all that stuff. That was fine. But this is where they could actually start to identify the spot. And then uh, this guy wasn't working with a body worker, but then he could like just take a tennis ball and work on that side of the spot sure. in that area. You know, just a little massage on the wall or even a little lying on the ground and just working that out some, some self-massage work. 
And, and, that, and that really made a, a big difference relatively quickly. Like that was the quickest way I could get that to happen. Um, one other way that I do that is um, using a, like a blow up ball, like I call it a togu ball. It's like a, I don't know, nine to 12, 13 inch diameter, soft, squishy ball, half deflated. And basically from a curl position, just take rotations from there mm -hmm. with the ball either behind the back, I'll do it as a curl, just a rotated curl, really feeling that rotation happening from the spine. And um, a lot of times with rotation, I'll use the image, you know, with a, an oblique curl of some kind, um, I use the image of you're really rotating at the spine. Yep. So rather than thinking of rotating the rib cage or the elbow, like not, don't get peripheral, think about the spine rotating and really picture that moving as you're on that ball. So you've got the proprioception and you've got that ability to really kind of work into it. That's another way that I worked with these clients. And then I would also take the ball and put it under the chest. Mm-hmm. Uh, hands behind the head or hands under the forehead and take rotation from uh, from prone. That's and getting into ways to train it. That's getting into something that I've thought of with uh, rotation, thoracic rotation. I find that sometimes their limitation is the kyphosis. Yeah. So often, oftentimes, what I need to do and gets back to why I had mentioned extension before because people don't often think about extension. They may think of rotation. But extension in and of itself can be so important because if they're so kyphotic, that's going to lead to a lot of limitation of how much they can rotate. So it almost, yeah. to me, means you need to work a little bit on an extension. And I love the idea of the togu ball between sort of the shoulder blades or even just slightly lower down that you can lie back against it and even do a little bit of small rotations. And how I will cue that is... If I'm, if I'm rotating to the left, I'll say lead with the right shoulder blade toward the ground. That way they're not mm -hmm. thinking of trying to do a crunch. Everybody's done crunches right. and crossovers that yeah, yeah. their natural instinct is, oh, I'm going to crunch this. Whereas if I tell right. them work that immediately, the paraspinal muscles begin to help. You know, the rhomboids pull the scapula back. They get a little bit more of that and they're going to get a little bit of extension as well. And I find that's just one way that I can combine the extension with the rotation and maybe get a little bit more motion going in a different sort of a different, hate to use the word plane, but a higher up on yeah. that, Yeah. you know, and again, thinking about, ex you know, thoracic extension, which a lot of our clients desperately need. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, the, that, that rotation, that's fantastic. I love doing all of that work with that. And it just, it just helps proprioceptively because mm -hmm. they can start to feel it. And thinking about, I mean, for me, I'll often just cue the back body in rotation, what we call in the balance body system, the posterior oblique slang from mm -hmm. you know the back shoulder across the thoracolumbar fascia to the opposite glute. Uh, I'll just cue that in the oblique mm -hmm. rather than the front. We're always cueing the front. And as soon as I do that, the range of motion increases yeah. every time. And it looks better. Every group. And it looks better and they seem more centered in their spine instead of adding that lateral flexion yep. or the other funkinesses that happen. So that's, that's, that's really nice. I love that, that imagery that you're using. One other thing that I want to mention about um, kyphosis, this is a modification, right? So I've had clients who extension is really difficult because they're not neutral. When, like they, their, their end range of motion is lying prone on the ground. Mm -hmm. Right, so if they're prone, they can't do a swan from there. They no can't way. do thoracic extension because they're already at or past their end range of motion in their yep. thoracic spine. So with that in mind, um, that's when I'll often go, okay guys, so what I want you to do is how do I pad them up? So that's where I'll also use the togu ball or even a, a full physio ball to have them lay over that. So they start in flexion and then they're gonna move into extension um, in whatever way that they can, mm -hmm. right? So maybe they're maybe they're going from, you know, flexed to slightly less flexed. Mm -hmm. That's fine. They're starting to get some of that mobility and some of those muscles stronger. Mm -hmm. So you've got to really work on that that um, uh, change, that modification. I often will start them with more of a passive way of doing it, where I will have them lie mm -hmm. on the foam roller like a T, and start uh -huh. under their shoulder blades, you know, hands behind the head and just let them lie over the foam roller. Yeah, yeah, Be yeah. Because gravity is going to help now. 
So instead of fighting gravity, gravity is actually pulling my upper, my upper body over the foam roller. And what I'll cue a lot of times is keep the ribs down. So get their abdominals engaged a little bit so that they're not just arching from their lumbar spine. They're really trying to keep their lumbar spine still and allowing that. And I had a physical therapist tell me it's kind of like a ratchet, you know, when you're tightening a screw or something. So she would tell me, okay, I want you to ratchet this. So I'd go back and hold and then come back into like a little crunch and do it again and again. And with each repetition, she says, you're going back about a, you know, a quarter of an inch each time, a little further and a little further. And after 10 repetitions, I found, wow, yeah, I'm going back a lot further. And I've noticed on a lot of clients, you can get gravity to really help pull you into that position, and especially if you get the abdominals engaged because they're not going to be arching from their back as much. And then eventually I'll have them add in that lumbar extension as well so that they are fully lying over it. And just as a relaxation, they love it. I can't tell you how many clients say, oh my gosh, I haven't felt this open in years. I feel like I can breathe. Nice. So yeah, exactly. That's fabulous. That'd be, that'd be definitely first steps. Like I was going through second steps. This is definitely first steps. It's just working on, on relaxing into it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And just getting what, getting what those tissues will allow and, mm-hmm. and letting the tissues find that more relaxed place and that more mobile place. I find that when we try and train against gravity, a lot of times the body doesn't really know what it's doing yet. And when I utilize gravity to yeah. help, because I can even, yeah. I mean, we can even cue that. And, you know, I can, you know, if I wanted to, I could put a band around their upper, you know, around their, under their armpits, you know, and, you know, have them push, you know, go back into extension. So I can load that if I wanted to. I find that I don't often need to. But when you do put them on their stomach and even get them into, a, like, you, like you do, a mini swan where they're using their hands to help push them up, so many people dump into their lumbar spine because they don't have the thoracic extension. And I don't know if you see this, but I see this in the fitness industry a lot. People who have been training for years work the mirror muscles. They love the stuff that they can see in the mirror. Yeah, exactly. So you get the biceps, you get the chest, you get the shoulders, anterior delts, you get the abs, you get all the things that allow us to flex and put us into Uh a kyphosis. And they're not often training as much in the lumbar spine or I mean in the posterior aspects. So they're not getting much posterior shoulder girdle as much as they should. Maybe they're not doing much, you know, uh, thoracic extension or lumbar extension. And I find those are the people when they come to me, you know, are already in a kyphosis. And then you add that in the last 10 years, five years, whatever it's been, they've been sitting at a desk. So now they're even tighter and more rounded forward. And now they want to go play pickleball. They want to go play tennis. And it's like, oh my gosh, <laughs> we have a lot of work before not you pick up a racket. <laughs> yeah, this is not going to be good for you. Oh, yeah, 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 no, I love that. Yeah, and when I, but when I work with Pilates instructors or people who do more Pilates, I find that they have more thoracic extension. And I don't know if it's just because of things like even doing a mini swan or a swan, it's sort of in the repertoire right from the start of mat work where they're going into more of a spinal extension and allowing that uh, thoracic extension that it's just more thought about in the in Pilates land versus, you know, the fitness. Well, so much more, I mean, Pilates from, you know, Joe Pilates way of thinking about it is so spinally, spinal centric. You know, spinal mobility is a key part of Pilates, as the Pilates method in every way and particularly flexion and extension. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, there's a little less emphasis on rotation, less emphasis on lateral flexion, which is what, you know, I always want to add into it. But extension is a a key part of it. Also remember that a lot of people that brought Pilates forward were dancers. Mm -hmm. And if anybody does thoracic extension and lumbar extension, it's dancers. It's just an aesthetic, you know, value of that particular sport. Um, and, And it's also... I, th- I think it's also looking at posture because, you know, to your point, whatever they did as a kid that brought them into that pattern, most people spend all their day either on their smartphone or on their computer. Mm-hmm. You know, again, as I say, the people that can afford you are probably sitting at a desk at a computer right now while they're not with you. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, right. And, and and it's not like they, it's not like they're mostly out there digging the fields or doing something more working class, if you will, right? Something that really is physical. Like uh, like most people that can afford us don't do physical work anymore. Right. 
Um, and so, you know, that habit is just endless. And mm -hmm. that lack of using the back of the body uh, is not just in fitness. I think it's just a general thing. Yeah. Yeah. That's just always something that's sort of in the back of my head. Uh, someone who you have familiarity with uh, that was a mentor of mine in college is Dr. Jan Prins. Mm -hmm. And he brought this up in class one day. He said, raise your hands if you guys train your abs. And of course, this is a kinesiology class. Everybody, uh, of course, they say, how many sets do you do? And he went around the room, just took a few things and you're like 20 sets per workout or eight sets or whatever it is. He said, how many of you do lumbar extension? And you could see everybody go, huh? It's, it's sort of like that RCA Victor dog look. We're all like, what, huh? <laughs> and I was like, wow, yeah. We may do a little bit of back extension and maybe we're doing, you know, one set or, you know, three sets, one, one round of back extensions. But compared to the amount of flexion work we do, we don't do much extension. And then when I got more into the industry and started working with my own thoracic kyphosis and whatnot, I started realizing, well, you know, something else is we don't do thoracic extension. So a lot of times I'll even just have them on a ball you know, leaning forward, hands on the ground and just lift my arms up into a Y because that takes me into a little bit of thoracic extension as long as I'm not arching my back and it wakes up those muscles. And it's like, wow, that really does wake things up and we don't do enough of that. Mm -mm, you know, you, we may see a little bird dog, but even that's only one-sided and most people focus on yeah, their leg. Yeah, and it's often not done with, with, I mean, it's a tiny bit of thoracic extension or not much. Right. You know, a lot of times. Um, yeah, no, there's a, there's, a, there's a bunch of pieces of Pilates, both the, the mat work and the pre-Pilates as well, that really focuses specific on thoracic extension. Yeah. You know, I mean, the, the main one I think about is done with or without a foam roller, you know, prone with your hands overhead, with your little finger on the ground, yep. and just sliding your shoulder blades back. Mm-hmm. Right, bring your chest forward, and um, and that alone is like, whoo! People will really wake up again. The thoracic extension. You mm -hmm. don't get lumbar extension with that. You really just get the thoracic extension, um, and that's just that's just powerful. But again, people don't do that. People don't spend any time in, in extension generally, no. and thoracic extension really even less so. Yeah, the one that I love, and I'm going to say that this is one of the exercises that I'm going to challenge people to do. Uh, at home, either with your clients or even with yourself, is I call it toes and nose. Uh, you stand against the wall, put your toes against the wall, put your nose against the wall, arms up and overhead. Now, for some people, I'll have their arms be relatively, you know, in an I position, others wider into a Y position, depending on what I want to focus on. You know, if I'm looking yeah. for more extension, I bring them a little, their biceps a little closer to their ears. If I'm looking for lower trapezius, okay. I might take them a little wider. And one arm at a time, pull it away from the wall while keeping my nose against the wall. Oh, nice. Start unilateral because it's waking up the lower trapezius. Yeah. You know, it's waking that up. Try not to get, ex try not to do external rotation because a lot of people will try and do external rotation through the elbow, you know, in the humerus, but really pulling back. And you can do it with either pinkies on the wall or palms on the wall. And then when they're comfortable enough with that, do both arms pulling back. Mm -hmm. I like this to start with because we're not fighting nice. against gravity. Yeah. And again, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a decent sized guy. I'm, you know, 190 pounds. So the weight of my arms granted is going to be more than a client I had earlier who is, you know, 110 pounds, but you know, she has to deal with her body. I have to deal with mine. So just lifting my arm is going to be relatively heavy. But when you use gravity to assist you and you're pulling straight back, you can wake up those muscles and begin to retrain them a little bit saying, oh, you want me to do what? Oh, okay, I got this. I can do this. So that when I do ask them to do it when they're in a prone position, their body sort of already has that ingrained. Oh, this is what you want me to do. Yeah, we've been doing it over there. Okay, we're going to do it like this. I also, I also love stuff always that could be done not on the floor. Right. You know, I just do. It, you know, in Pilates, we do a lot of stuff on the mat. We do a lot of stuff on the floor, and that's great stuff. But 
I've had many clients who, you know, getting up and down is half the half the battle. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you know, I'll have them do it on a trap table, or I'll have them on a higher surface, so they can do a lot of the, the stuff on the, the, the mat work. But um, having some people can do standing up because you know you talk about your athletes, they're not going to get down on the golf course. They're right. not going to get down on the tennis court. Precisely. Like, why would you lie down on that? Like it's just not going to happen. So I think, and then even at home, like that gives them no excuse. Yep. And I, I'm really big on giving clients no excuses to not do the two or three things I want them to do for homework. Yep. Yep. So toes and nose is one that I love to give. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Cause love it, it is easy. That yeah. and <laughs> this is one because most of them are so kyphotic anyway, just a chest stretch, you know, stepping through the doorway. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's something that's simple. And I tell them every time you go to the bathroom, Going in or going out, hold it for 10 seconds. It doesn't have to be long. Just to yeah, remind. Just remind yourself your arm can go behind you. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. It. And it's just a simple, easy way to do it. So, you know, we always like to end with um, an exercise. So that's sort of the one that I would challenge people with. That one and the telescope arms. And I'll walk people through that really quick standing up. Uh, I'll put their shoulder against the wall and their hip against the wall arm straight out in front of them. Then I'm going to take the outside leg forward because that's going to help to center my hips. My hips won't, if you don't, your hips are going to want to twist you. So I put my outside leg slightly in front of my bottom leg and then hands on top of each other. I will take the top arm and reach way past the arm that's against the wall. So you get that rotation towards the wall, toward the wall forward. My chest goes toward the wall. Then I slide my hand along, along my uh, opposite palm along the forearm chest until I'm trying to put that arm against the wall. My right, my shoulder will be trying to reach the wall and my arm will be against the wall. But at the same time, the arm that is already on the wall, I'm going to reach forward, allowing for greater mm-hmm. rotation. Nice. The counter, the counter, the counter pull. Exactly. Yeah. And nice. I tell people, especially people who have SUVs, I said, you've got a wall there. You know, you got your big old suburban, just do it on the side of that. And they do it before they play golf. And every one of them says, oh, I hit the ball so much better. I walk out there and I say, do five on each side. You don't have to do much. Do five on each side. And then on the ninth hole, do it again. Find a wall. You're going to find some place that you can do it. Just do a few. Find something. Yeah. And sometimes once they get the motion, I say, okay, technically you don't even need a wall. You can sort of feel what you're trying to get at. The wall just gives them some reference points. So those are two hints that I'm going to tell people just to get rotation and extension that's in a standing position where they don't have to worry about getting down on the ground, you know, where gravity is assisting rather than fighting against you. Nice. So I'm going to ask you what your exercise or two would be for trying to create greater movement of the thorax. So... To, you know, I've talked about the ball, I've talked about the roller, I've talked about the bridging. So those are some I use a lot. But a really simple one is, I basically learned this from, I, I did a lot of uh, martial arts, Tai Chi and, and Qigong and some, um, some uh, Korean martial arts, Taekwondo when I was younger. And one of the things that I loved from all of those is take a wide leg stance, like they'd call it a horse stance from there, bend the knees, come into like kind of a, a, mi- a mild squat, and then just rotate, just a nice, easy, Full, full body rotation. And, and I think of that happening a lot from the hips. Uh-huh. Like press that hip forward and just let the arms swing and sway. Um, and I'll do that for, again, if it doesn't make you dizzy, I'll do that for like you know, 25 sets. So I'll do 50 full. Um, to each no, side, 50, 25 50, each 50. side. Yeah. yeah, exactly. 25 each side, just back and forth. Find the breath pattern that works for it. Um, and oftentimes that alone will just loosen things up, get people ready to go. Nice. And then you know, do that before golf, do that before running, do that before whatever you're going to do. And again, you can do it standing up, you can do it anywhere. It doesn't need a prop and it's really helpful. Do you, do you cue the arms in any way, shape or form? The reason I'm asking is when I think of martial arts, uh, I go back to when I was seven years old and did karate, <laughs> but that's sort of the yeah. stance and you are sort of throwing a punch forward doing that rotation or do you prefer arms out wide, you know, allowing for more of a whipping effect or how do you? I, I do it about I do it two or three different ways. So one way that I do it is just, just let the arms whip around on their own. Mm-hmm. So you just feel like, you're, so they're just kind of whapping you on one hip and then whapping you on the other hip, right? Okay. Moving across the body. So just taking that nice and easy. 
The other way that I'll do it, um, and I've started to add this in, first I'll do that one, then the second piece of that is um, they'll actually reach the arm out and rotate in that back foot, like they're rotating to the side to reach to that side, mm. and then they're gonna reach to the other side. So they're adding in that hip, really coming up into rotation on that side and transferring that through the arm. Nice. So, yeah, you know, like they're just like tapping, like they're tapping a wall this way, tapping a wall that way. Oh, um, I and I'll, I'll take that as, as part two. No, I like that a lot because you're actually, tra uh, like you say, you're transferring the energy, taking it instead of just keeping it within the thorax, you're really taking it into the lumbar spines and into the hip. So you're really allowing yeah. that movement, especially if they are going to play a sport, an activity that really does help remind the force transfer. Yeah, and I'll cue them like if, if they really are not a hip mover, which a lot of people aren't, I'll really cue the hip movement. I'll yeah. initiate this whole thing from the hip just to get that motion going, like if it's a golfer particularly, because um, a, a lot of times that piece is missing. And then that, that warms that whole kinetic chain piece up, and then they can, can get a little more power out of what they're doing. I love it. Awesome. Awesome. Any final thoughts uh, before we wrap this one up? Because I know we could go for another three hours. I know you and I, we can keep talking about this. And I know we're going to come back. We're going to circle back to pretty much all of our topics, you know, over the course of this podcast, because there's so much more and we're learning more. And as we learn, we want to yeah. share, you know? Yeah, exactly. So I didn't know if you had any final, final thoughts. I think my, my only final thoughts are just think about this. You know, if you're out there and you're listening, um, spend this week thinking about thoracic rotation for your clients, noticing what works, play with some of what we're doing in terms of these exercises. Um, and just, you know, like, enjoy it. Like, it, it really feels good. Clients love it. If you can find a way to, to make them do it in a way that's tolerable, they love it. It makes their breath feeling better. It makes them generally feel better. Um, so it's just good stuff to play with. And it really changes things so fast. Mm -hmm. It does. It does. So, yeah, I'm going to say the same thing. I'm going to challenge you to include it in every one of your clients' workouts. Just one exercise, you know, something simple that they can do or for their homework, you know, to challenge them and see how their body feels and see if you notice, you know, low back pain going, you know, reducing, mm -hmm. see if you notice yeah. shoulder pain reducing, see if you notice anything, you know, changing in their bodies. And sometimes just getting them to move in a different way in a different plane of motion really can make huge changes. Yeah, exactly. So, okay, guys, go out there and twist. This is a twist and shout. <laughs> exactly. Go out there and do the twist. Oh, no, you got Now I'm going to earworm the rest of the day. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, on that, uh, thank you so much for joining us for another uh, Moving Conversations. Uh, you can always reach us on our social media, uh, Instagram, Moving Convos, as well as Moving Convos at gmail.com, website, movingconversationslive.com. You can check out that that's going to have updates as to where we're going to be live doing our two-day events. Uh, come on out, talk to us, see us. Uh, you're going to learn a whole lot. We go over all of this stuff in such great detail, and we make it a lot more functional, usable, and practical. So come and join us, and we will see you next week. Thanks, guys. <laughs>